Hello and welcome back to the Matrix Green Pool Podcast. I'm Hill Marie Hutchison and today I'm excited to welcome back Dr. Stephen Barden, a guest we had on the show just a little over a year ago. Our conversation was so intriguing and interesting that I knew we had to have a follow-up because we hardly scratched the surface. Stephen is a corporate strategic alignment specialist, an author, and a podcaster. He is a renowned management consultant who specializes in helping organizations align their culture, processes, and leadership practices to achieve strategic goals. His insights on leadership, power, and success provide a fresh perspective on how we define and choose our leaders. I'm thrilled to have him back on the podcast to share his latest thoughts and strategies for driving sustainable success in today's evolving business landscape. Stephen, welcome back. How are you? Thank you, Hilary. I'm great. I'm sitting in the sunshine here, so it's lovely. Yeah, I'm good. Fantastic. It's so great to have you with us again. So to start off, can you share what's new in your work since our last conversation? Since our last conversation, for a start, I changed the name of the company that I run from Stephen Barton Coaching Limited to uh, one reflecting more about my work, and that is strategic alignment. And I think that's probably because much as I was working with individuals, particularly individual leadership, and trying to get realignment of strategies through them, it became very clear to me that one of the things that is very important that one needs to work with organizations, profit and non-profit, holistically. Because if you're coaching or working, being a mentor to one person, it has pretty limited impact, I think. It doesn't mean if you're working with the CEO or with the CFO that the organization is going to be in alignment. One of the things that I'm doing now, and I'm focusing more and more now, is looking at the entire organization and how those organizations can program themselves for sustainable success. In other words, that they're able to keep going and they're able to keep growing, but based very much on, and we, you know, we go into that further, based very much on the purpose of that organization, what it's there to do. So that's what I've been focusing on, being a little less focused on the individual, a lot more focused on organizations. You have mentioned that many organizations have lost the ability to think forensically about their purpose. Can you maybe unpack that for us? What does forensic thinking mean in this context and how can leaders cultivate this mindset within their team? I think what I'm saying there, they've really got to be really incisive about what is the purpose of their organization? Why are they there? What do they set out to do? And that doesn't mean, by the way, the purpose is to make money because that's not what you go in for. You go in to make cars or to provide services. And one of the end goals is going to be making money so that you actually continue doing that purpose. And it's also, by the way, purpose is, is also not the vision. I do hate that word, but it's not the vision. It's not what do I aspire to do? It is what am I here to do? What is the reality of what I'm doing? What are the services I'm providing or the products I'm providing at what quality level and to whom? And that's basically what you're trying to do. And you need to be able to be pretty analytical and forensic about that because from there then stems the follows up. So if that's what I'm here to do at this level of quality, for these people or for this section of the market, then you're able to talk about strategy. You're able to say, well, how am I going to do it? With what channels, with what resources, with what skills, flexible working, non-flexible working, blah, blah, blah. And how much resource do I need and money do I need to be able to do that? So the purpose has got to be there. And people forget that. You know, you find in a lot of organizations now, and I'm thinking particularly, for example, of the German car industry, is did they forget their purpose was to make for example, Volkswagen, to make high volume vehicles and to be able to provide people with high volume, efficient, effective, cost effective vehicles. Did they forget that? And did they suddenly think or gradually think that their purpose was to provide German cars that people will buy? So you work with the organizations to help them to discover or rediscover or just refocus on their purpose? Rediscover. Most of them, when they're established, it's rediscover, go back and find out and remember what your purpose is and refine it and make it absolutely precise. Purpose doesn't have all those 
aspirations, if you like, that um, vision has. You don't get to it. The purpose is, why am I here? What am I doing? What am I producing? At what level of quality? And to whom? Boom, that's it. And that's got to be done very, very, very carefully because it opens up a lot of questions. A lot of organizations I know will go, well, you know, I know what my purpose is. I know why I'm here. They don't. They forgot. They've muddled it with vision. They've muddled it with strategy. They've muddled it with tactics. Even if leadership know what their purpose is, that maybe the whole organization is not aware that only certain people know and they haven't been able to instill that in the whole organization. I think that's absolutely right, because a lot of particularly in successful organizations that have been successful, that purpose becomes so vague, they're very reluctant to go back and say, what are we here for? I don't know, take a company like Mercedes, for example, it will start thinking to itself, hang on, what am I doing trying to go back to my purpose? I know what my purpose is. I'm making luxury vehicles or semi-luxury vehicles. And they won't then take that purpose and drill it down to the rest of their organization, because it takes work, you know. No, Hilmarie. It takes work. It takes a huge amount of analysis. It takes sustainable working through the all the levels of the organization. And you begin to have to say things to yourself as an organization that you haven't been prepared to admit to before, or you haven't been prepared to admit to for a very, very long time. For example, am I doing what I'm set out to do? Do I need to change? And of course, when you've got a big organization that now needs to change, that also takes pain. It's not a simple process to get back to where they need to be. Now, you've mentioned that organizations often struggle with aligning their culture and practices with strategic outcomes. Can you elaborate on why this alignment is crucial and how it impacts overall performance? Once you've got that purpose and you're then saying, okay, so how am I going to do that? Some of the questions you're going to ask are going to be, what skills do I need? What behaviors do I need to be able to achieve that purpose and that strategy towards the ends? What assumptions do I need to have or break or change? And of course, culture is assumptions, it's behaviors, it's beliefs, it's the ability to use the attitude, if you liked, how do you going to use your resources? Do you use them tightly? Do you invest? you innovate, all that has got to be aligned. Again, let's go back to the car industry. If the particular car industry or car company says its purpose is to develop high volume electric vehicles to middle class owners or to fleets in Europe, then its culture has got to be that way. It's got to be able to say to itself, my behaviors have got to be such so that I am aiming at innovating vehicles and products and services that aim specifically at that. My culture has got to be curious. I've got to know about my customers because I'm now introducing a new vehicle, if you like. I've got to know what's going on in politics. And I can't, for example, the culture has got to be not trying to protect an old industry by saying to government, you know, let's carry on with fossil fuel vehicles for the next 20 years. Just give us a bit of time. It's got to be courageous enough to be able to say to government, guys, we need to move quickly now. We need to be able to move forward. You need to give incentives to our new customers. So all of that is behaviors. All of that is part of the culture, the behavior, the attitude towards government, towards customers, towards internally. They've also got to say to themselves, okay, so is, for example, to take a topic we've been talking about, you know, is, for example, is it good for the company, good for the organization that we have flexible working? What kind of flexible working? Who's going to do the flexible working? What does it mean? All of those are part of the culture. Unless you're aligning, you're going to get distracted and you're going to distract yourself from your ultimate end, which is, as we said, you know, the purpose of the organization. Starts with identifying, being very clear about what the purpose is, then making sure that we've got behaviors, assumptions, beliefs aligned with a corporate purpose. Can you maybe share some strategies or practices that have proven effective in achieving this alignment? Examples, I suppose, I'm just trying to think of, you know, where I have worked with an organization where we started off like that and their innovation rate, their success rate was very, very high. And they started moving into markets, into areas that they hadn't thought of before, because again, you know, we got the purpose, we aligned the culture and 
the behaviors, and they started getting innovative and curious. So they went into new areas and did very well. But of course, what then happens, they lapse into the old ways. They say, okay, so we've done that. We don't need to do anymore. We're just going step by step, going forward in a sort of progressive way rather than thinking innovatively. So that's one of them. I think, for example, if you look at the big EV companies in China and the biggest one specifically, the biggest EV vehicle company in China, it started off making small batteries. By 2020, it had innovated and created a new battery. And then it decided, right, now we've got that, we can move into developing EVs. And then it said, right, so how are we going to get into Europe? And it did not only EVs, but it said, if we want high volume, we need to do two things. What do we need to do? We need to go into fleet vehicles and we need to go into buses. And that's what they've done. It has overtaken Tesla in the production of EVs. And I think it has something like, I don't know, 28% of the, of the global market on electric vehicles. That is a company that has been totally aligned with what its purpose is. And no hesitation that everything was aligned to doing that. People may say, well, that's very, you know, much simpler to do in China, where you have apparently a much more command and control way of doing things. But actually, think about it. These guys have been totally aligned in behavior, in resource, in everything to its strategic goals and its purpose, of course. So what I'm hearing you saying is that they started off smally, smaller, got all the fundamentals right, knew what their purpose was, had that, that everything, the behaviors, everything in alignment, and then they were able to pivot and grow to where they have such a, a big penetration now of the market. That's exactly right. In your work with leaders, how do you recommend implementing feedback mechanisms to assess whether the organization is on track with its strategic alignment? Your biggest feedback is going to be from clients and what they're saying about you. Your biggest feedback is going to be from another feedback mechanism, of course, is how are you progressing towards that goal? You know, it's a bit like the somebody said to me, the aim in golf is to get the ball closer to the hole. Well, how close are you getting? So feedback in terms of at least progress towards your strategic goals are there. I think as well, you need to be able to go back always to your people as well and say, you know, these are our goals, you know, these are our purpose. You know, this is our strategy. So you've got to be very transparent about all those things to your people and saying, what do you think? How do you think we're doing? What should we be doing better? And doing that in pulse checks all the time, almost constantly doing pulse checks and in doing it in getting scenario planning being done at all levels of the organization. There are a lot of mechanisms. Scenario planning, I particularly like. The military uses that in their campaign maneuvers. The mining industry does that as well. Take a scenario and push it through take it through to its end and say, is this working successfully? Can this work successfully? What do we need to do? What are the risks that we need to be avoiding or even facing full frontal? Sum up clients, market, your own people, your success towards your own goals, all that's of phenomenal and very useful feedback mechanisms. It means that you as part of a culture have got to be really, again, forensic, analytical, curious about your own progress or about your lack of progress. So companies need to have these processes set in place so that they can do these regular check-ins and make sure that they are on track where they need to be. You mentioned in the introduction about distractions. So in your experience, what are some common distractions that prevent organizations from focusing on their strategic goals and how can they mitigate these distractions? A lot of the distractions come from the assumptions or the priorities one sets. And some of those priorities are set because the organization is paralyzed or is not adventurous enough in its own, in progressing towards its own core purpose, if you like. You know, one of the distractions has been since COVID, we have flexible or remote working. What sort of remote working should we have? Should the default position be flexible working? Well, why don't you ask yourself a different question, which is what sort of working will enable the company to succeed most effectively? Instead of saying just what is good for the workers or what is good for the people, think about what is good for your people, the employees in that organization as part of the organization, taking that organization to its success. So distractions in cultural norms, if you like, are an issue. And I think HR organizations need to be able to to pivot and start asking the questions, what is good for the organization rather than what is good simply for people 
outside the context. That's one. The other distractions, of course, the major distractions, in particular in well-established organizations, are the cultural echo chamber, where they listen only to one another, to the hierarchies in there rather than outside. And I've seen a number of organizations, as I know you have, instead of looking outside at the quality and the delivery of their products and services, they get distracted by the politics and the power structures inside. So you tend to be pleasing. Your measure of success is how well do you please your bosses or your stakeholders inside the organization rather than the outside. So politics, internal politics, enormous distraction. Cultural norms that are sort of established by popular demand or whatever it is, like flexible or non-flexible working, another distraction. The distraction of the echo chamber, if you like, is another one. So those are big distractions. And I think the only way you're going to do it is when I'm saying is remembering, refining, defining your purpose and aligning everything to do that and making sure you have the feedback mechanisms that tell you how well or how badly you are doing and be very honest about how badly you're doing. Instead of making decisions that's convenient, we need to be making decisions through the lens of what is best for the company in achieving its strategic goals and achieving that purpose. So to have that clear for in the forefront all the time to working through that will help us to not get distracted by all these things that can come in the way. Looking ahead, what trends do you foresee shaping the future of organizational culture and strategy and how should leaders prepare for these changes? It depends which way we go. I think there are going to be different trends in different parts of the world. For example, I think there certainly will be different trends in the East and the Middle East than there are in the so-called West. One of the trends that I do see happening is that there will be far more nationalistic or national priorities encroaching on the economy. I think you will probably see a weakening of the global economies, global trade, all that stuff. You will see more barriers. So therefore, you've got to start, leaders need to start looking at alternatives. You cannot be focused on what is the easiest market at the moment, because the easiest market may turn out to be one that you're blocked from in the future because of national priorities that go on. So one of those things is to make sure that you've got the balance of customers and clients if you are multinational, if you like. That's a very important one for me. I think as well, there will probably be a trend towards much more local manufacturing and local productions. That will happen. And I think as well, as the big financially or investment companies get more and more powerful because of global trends, you will find that ownership of organizations, possibly in the short term, possibly in the longer term, organizations will be owned far more by these big investment companies as pure investments. And the danger there, of course, is that they may be looking even more than they are looking now for fast returns. This idea of mine of having the purpose, if you like, and looking to the integrity of that purpose and creating long-term sustainable goals will or may in fact be jeopardized. I don't see that happening in the East. I don't see that happening in India and China and places like that. I do certainly see that happening in Europe and I think certainly in the United States. As always, such insights. It's fantastic. I love asking you these questions and hearing your insights. And one of the takeaways I also heard from right there was don't put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to your customer base. Yeah. Absolutely love it. So insightful. Thank you so much. Because you've been a guest on the podcast before, you know what comes next. This is our segment where I'll ask you some rapid fire questions, a version of a game show. Are you ready? Probably. I know that you've lived in many different places around the world. So what is your go-to comfort food? Is a very good Vietnamese soup, a pho, followed by some of their most wonderful papaya salads. Vietnamese and Indian love this. When I smell rice, Hilmarie, I just breathe a sigh of relief. Indian is my favorite food, so I can absolutely relate. Do you have a favorite city? 
No, I don't actually. I used to love New York. I used to love Paris. I don't have a favorite city. I tend to love places which I go to now because I'm there. The more I live in the present, the more I sort of love places when I go there. And as long as I'm open to their culture and the way they do things and don't try and be judgmental or think they should be doing it this way or that way. I don't have a favorite city anymore, no. I love that. To be in the moment, no matter where you are, is what makes it fantastic. Are you more for sunrise or a sunset person? I'm more of a sunrise person. It's a very special time for me. And the last question, coffee or tea? Coffee. Well, thank you for playing along. That was easy enough. Now we've come to the segment where I'll ask our green pill question. What was your green pill moment, the action or event that was the turning point for you or your career? It's always my answer. Again, as I get older, I think, in fact, the last 20 years, I suppose, I've been thinking, I work very much on text and context. The life-changing moments, according to their context, if you like, the events don't change me. It's the choice or the decision I make on how to deal with that event, the event change. And those events can be tiny. They can be absolutely tiny or they can be major. For example, when I was thrown out of South Africa in the apartheid days, the decision that I made was to carry on being in the media business because that was the quickest way to make money and to support my family. That was my decision. I could have gone in a whole lot of different ways. I could have gone into exile politics. I could have done other things. That was the decision I made. And the decisions I made was to make money in an industry that I was familiar with. The big event was being thrown out. It wasn't that that changed me. What changed me was my decision to say, right, I need now to make money. There are no green pill events. The green pill is my choice of things. That's what I'm saying. So in any advice I would give to anybody else is don't let events change you. Think about how you're going to deal with those events. That's what you need to do and take responsibility for your decisions. That's also very insightful as all the other comments you've made in this uh, podcast and the previous one. Yes, it's how we react to things that has the impact at the end of the day. It's not the actual event. It's how we respond, which then sets the course for what comes next. Yeah, quite right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again for being here today. Just like last time, I absolutely love this conversation and I'm so sure our audience is going to really enjoy it. Just as a reminder for our listeners, where can they find and follow you? My uh, website is uh, www.stephenbarden.org. I am on LinkedIn. So I have uh, the LinkedIn site gives all my stuff and any podcasts I do and I post quite a lot. It's under Dr. Stephen Barden and LinkedIn. I also have a podcast relevant to this one, which is called The Power of Balance, and that you can find on all the usual podcast sites. And if, of course, they want to go into um, more in depth into the way I approach leadership and the way I approach life in many ways, it's the book that I wrote, which is called How Successful Leaders Do Business with Their World. And as you know, it's got very little to do with business, but it's all got to do with dealing with your world. That was also fascinating, the power and the impact of one's youth. I thought that was so fascinating the last time. So I'd highly recommend that our audience uh, look you up, follow your podcast, go and listen to those podcasts and find the book as well. Thank you again for joining me. I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Hilmarie. marie That was lovely, as ever. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely talking. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Stephen Barden, please leave us a five-star review. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode from us. Stay tuned for more inspiring conversations. Until next time, keep dreaming big and chasing those goals. If you enjoy our conversations, please like and subscribe. See you next Wednesday.